Florida, and uh, where I grew up, we used to we used to surf, but I I called it surfing. Most everyone else would call it falling down a lot on a on a board. Uh, I I love surfing, and I, like I grew up in a beach, beach culture. And the first time I went to California uh, was probably 23, 24 years old, Southern California. And I immediately called my parents and said, I think you made a fatal mistake in my life. I think God intended for me to be born in Southern California, and you missed that calling for me. And they went, no, you weren't supposed to be born there. <laughs> They were like, uh, but yeah, I've always, I've loved, loved surfing. I love beach culture. There's something about it that I, I grew up on the beach and I was telling, uh, I don't know where he is. I was telling him earlier, my dad uh, is a is a police officer in, uh, or he's a retired police officer in Panama City. And he, or he said, oh, where'd you, where'd you grow up? I said, Panama City, Florida. He goes, man, no one grows up there. That's just a party town. I said, yeah, you're right. I said, every, every time I tell somebody that, they go, oh, yeah, I've been there once when I was in college for spring break. Uh, yeah, I know. That's what everybody says. Uh, so, yes, I, uh, I am so, so very excited to be here with you. Thank, thank you again for uh, allowing me to be here and, and talk to you for a few minutes. I told uh, uh, Pastor Andre and Timberly, this is like my uh, home away from home. It's like a like second family for me out here. I love Las Vegas. I fell in love with it in uh, 2009, the first year that we came out here to do the laundry project. And um, uh, telling people back home about every time we, we do stuff in Las Vegas, they always go, right, you're going to Las Vegas to do some, to do some missions work out there, right? And so my joke now is like, I'm just going to raise some money for current. That's what I'm, I'm just going out there to raise some money. That's all. Uh, in the casinos. And uh, but I always tell them like, yeah, there's something about Las Vegas that most, you know, the rest of the world sees Las Vegas in one light. And it's all about the, the strip that every, you know, everything that everyone sees about Las Vegas. I try to explain to them like there's, you know, there's so much more to that. When you get past that strip, there's so, there's so much more. There's a life, there's, there's people. Um, but what most people don't know about Las Vegas is we all outside of Las Vegas think of the wealth and the opulence of Las Vegas uh, and the thing that I discovered in 2009 coming here was that while there is very much that in one portion, there is so much more the opposite uh, in, in the city. And there are people that are hurting and suffering and in need of love and care. And I don't think there's enough people doing that in the world. And um, so got to know Pastor Andre and Timberly and uh, fell in love with them and fell in love with you, and so thank you so much for being a part of what we do uh, to serve people in a very simple way by providing clean laundry. Uh, four, six months ago was the last time that we, that we did it together. First of all, yesterday, uh, we did it at one location. Six months ago, we did three locations around the city with you and uh, some other, a couple other people, and uh, yesterday at the one location on Eastern and Bonanza, we, had, we went through 37 families and they did like 600 loads of laundry, like right at 600 loads, which is a lot of laundry for 37 people. Yeah. And uh, at like 11.30, we had to, had to tell our, our team, we can't take any new people. Start taking the signs down. We still got an hour and a half left to go, but we can't take any more because they have so much laundry. It's going to take us another hour and a half to finish all these people that are already on the list and in line waiting. Um, but it was an incredible, it's an incredible day, some amazing stories. The one story that was, uh, I say my favorite, but it's probably, not a, it's probably not a great way to put it because it's not a, in one way it's a great story, in the other way it's a very sad story. Um, there was a girl that came yesterday, uh, probably mid-20s, very nice, very sweet girl. Uh, she was there right at the beginning. She walked from her home. She had a ton of laundry pushed it in a, I think it was a grocery cart. It was a baby stroller. That's right. She had a baby stroller and just like, like bags of laundry piled under this baby stroller and washed from her home a couple miles away and, uh, works two jobs and had to be at work at like one o'clock, I think. And, uh, she ends up in a conversation with one of the, one of the ladies that was, was helping and come to find out this, this young girl, she, six months ago when we did our laundry projects, we, one of the locations we did is one that you've done with us before on Charleston. And she came to that 
laundry project back then. She, I think she lives a little closer to that one and ended up coming there, got her clothes washed. Come to find out that's the last time she was washed her clothes was when we helped her six months ago. And she was so ecstatic that we were there and so just thankful and um, the thing for her what was so funny like she was like stressed and I gotta I gotta get to work soon and it's so busy and these ladies just loved on her and said uh, listen don't worry about walking home like we'll put you in our car we'll drive you home uh, so that you make it to work on on time and we'll we'll drop you off at work if we need to uh, and the one thing that stood out to me and why I said it's my favorite story because through all the all the thing about all the people that are there and all the number of laundry loads that we do and all of that and putting quarters in machines, those are all well and good things and that's what it's for and that provides a lot of hope. But the underlying part of that, of what she experienced in that couple of hours of people just loving her with no, um, you know, no judgment about, okay, you got evicted from your home. Who knows why? But the point is, we're going to love you as best we can in this moment. Um, and we're happy to do your laundry again because that gives you some hope and some dignity and we want you to know that you're loved and that God cares for you and it was a great conversation they had in that scenario and that's what the laundry love project is about is providing that love and we're not necessarily changing their whole life but that's okay because something we're going to talk about today that's kind of the idea that I want to talk a little bit about today is um, we don't have to change everyone's entire life we can change a moment for them because that gets them to the next moment where God gives them another miracle and another miracle um, throughout the day. But I think we get caught up. And so I think we're conditioned in our world, especially in the United States, of this right now results, big results. And we forget that there is a very clear passage that says some people plant a seed, some people water it, some people see the results. We always want to be the results people. We don't want to be the one necessarily planting the seed or the one watering it. Um, but that's just as important for us because um, that moment of watering that seed in her life in that moment may get maybe the very thing she needs to get to the next moment where the results happen uh, and so uh, all of that yesterday was because of you because of your involvement because even though you weren't there physically in spirit and in so many ways and you were there uh, and and God brought you into that moment with us so thank you for for what you, what you do to serve uh, people in this community. Uh, and so on that, what, you know, this idea of changing the world, I think we, we hear that a lot. People talk about changing the world and um, we use that terminology a lot. We use the terminology of like, you know, we just want to change the world. I can't, I, I remember um, uh, when I was in my early 20s, or actually when I got, kind of got a little bit later, I used to hate going to the grocery store and seeing the magazines that had the, uh, I think it would like People Magazine would do this a lot. Nothing would make me more depressed than seeing the cover of this magazine that would say something like 50 people under 15 years old changing the world or 15 people under 20, 20 people under 20 changing the world. And here's, you know, like a 10 year old kid that cured some incurable disease, you know, by coughing or, you know, did something, some, something in his blood, you know, that he figured out. Uh, and there's all these people. And I remember I would stand in the, I'd stand in line at the grocery store and go, might as well give up now. I, like I've already passed my twenties and I'll, I'll cover the magazine is all the people under 20 that are changing the world. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> might as well just give it up. But I always hated that, hated that idea because there's this mentality, I think for us of changing the world is a big, is a big thing. We get this idea of changing the world, and it's almost this overwhelming idea. Now, I love to, I love to search Google Images for, uh, for different ideas of things that I'm thinking about. And so I search Google Images for changing the world. Like, what visual images are out there that, that come to mind when we put in, when we think changing the world? And one of the images, probably the most prominent image, is this image right here. For some reason, it's always a hands on a globe. <laughs> like I see this and I've seen, you know, like people use it in marketing and things like that. And I go, I, well, that's just weird. Where are those hands coming from out in, out in outer space? And, I, you know, what's it doing? Like, it's almost like, like the next one I think is the best because it like, uh, I'm going to massage the globe. 
give it a give it a little massage. That's how I'm going to change the world. Uh, the other, the next one, I think is that's funny. It's like I don't I don't really know what's going on here, but these are like some of the top images. Like we're going to keep the world spinning, and that's how we'll change it. And we get multiple hands in there together, spinning spinning the world. But this one was the funniest one to me. Golden words by a wise man. If you want to change the world, do it when you're a bachelor. After marriage, you can't even change the TV channel. <laughs> right. <laughs> so true. Uh, but that, to me, so put that first image back up for me because I want to talk about that for a second. Um, this is an interesting idea to me because this, like, this is the visuals that we see or that we use. Like if you see an organization and they do some uh, uh, marketing, it's always something about people joining hands and there's a globe involved or holding a globe and that kind of stuff, which is all well and good. And, it's a, and it, you know, to me, it's a funny image. But the reason it's funny to me is that would be nice if that's how small the world was for us. This mentality of changing the world and this visual that we think of when it comes to that is puts the mentality that we're big enough and the world is small enough that we can put our hands on it in that way that we can affect that type of change. One of two things happens. We get the idea that we live at this 100,000 mile view of the world and we can, we can spin the world in the way that we want it to spin. Or we look at the world as so big and we see the problems of the world as so big and poverty and all these things. And we get caught in the idea that the world is so big, there's nothing that I can do to change it. And really, both ideas are wrong. Because this view is the 100,000 mile view. We don't, we don't live at the 100,000 mile view of the world. Only God lives that view. We live at the six foot level of world, or some of us, the five foot six view of the world. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we don't live at this world view that is, that is up so high that people look like ants and that we, pieces on a board that we can move around. We live at the level of the world where people are the same size we are and have the same size problems that we have. And the idea of changing the world, when we refocus on that idea, changes the game for us because it makes it manageable. There's a great story, one of my favorite stories in the book book of Mark, chapter 2. And if you have a Bible and you want to uh, take some notes and pull that out, great. It'll also be on the screen. Um, Mark chapter 2 is, uh, is one of my favorite stories, uh, the beginning of Mark chapter 2. It's an interesting thing that's going on here. Let me paint the picture for you. Jesus uh, has, has kind of just begun his ministry. He's just come off of uh, being baptized, and he starts going around and preaching and traveling to a couple different cities from where he was from. And he's taking the message of hope to these other cities. And in Mark chapter 2, the beginning of it says the first couple of things. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. I'm going to take a time out right there. Comes back home, news spreads quickly. Something I never noticed before about a lot of the stories in the Bible, until, uh, in the Gospels until recently, um, is something as simple as these few words here, that news spread quickly. And I started thinking, why does, the, why does the news spread so quickly? Why did anyone care that Jesus was back home? Why would this news spread? And there's an interesting story right before Mark chapter 2, and it's not going to be on the screen, but I'm going to read you what happens just before this in the last few verses of Mark chapter 1. Jesus heals a man with leprosy, and this is what it says. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. And this is what he says to him. If you want to... You can make me well again, he said. Moved with pity, Jesus touched him. He said, I want to be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared. The man was healed. Then Jesus sent him on his way and told him sternly. Now, I feel like if I experienced Jesus in person, physically, and he said something to me sternly, I'd probably do it. 
So this is what he says to him. Go right over to the priest and let him, and let him examine you. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy so everyone will have proof of your healing. But as the man, now here's what happened though. But as the man went on his way, he spread the news telling everyone what had happened to him. As a result, such crowds soon surrounded Jesus that he couldn't enter a town anywhere publicly. He had to stay out of the secluded places, out in the secluded places and people from everywhere came to him there. Now, here's the fascinating thing. First of all, this guy didn't do anything that Jesus told him. He did the exact opposite. Did you ever know, did you ever have that moment like you tell someone to do something, but you know they're not listening to you? Like they're just thinking about the next thing they're going to do anyway, despite what you tell them? I, like here's, but what's fascinating to me is this guy was so excited about his, what Jesus had done for him. His natural reaction was, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eventually get there to go make my offerings and get the priest. But along the way, I'm not, I can't help it. I got to tell everyone that I, I used to be, I was dying of leprosy and no longer am I dying from leprosy. He spread the news. He did exactly the opposite of what Jesus told him. But here's the fascinating thing. The thing that I miss so often in my life in growing up and reading the stories of the Gospels Right after this, leading into chapter 2 in this opening, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly. Why did this news spread quickly? And here's what I I figured out. The news spread quickly. And people came to where Jesus was, not because he was telling the world how he could change it. Not because he was handing out free gift, free pass to heaven cards. The crowds came to Jesus because they knew that there was a man that was once dying of leprosy and he encountered another man named Jesus and Jesus healed him of that leprosy and I'm dying of a sickness and if I can get to where this guy Jesus is, maybe he'll do the same for me because the world that they lived in was the struggle of their own life. They couldn't see past everything that to be concerned with the rest of the world. What they were concerned with is I'm dying in some way and I need to get to this man that I heard about named Jesus and maybe he'll heal me like he healed that guy that was dying of leprosy. So many stories in the Bible that way. The man that was born blind, that the disciples said, Jesus, what sin did this person do in a former life that caused him to be born blind? He said, nothing. He was just born blind. And Jesus heals him of his blindness and he goes away and the Pharisees come to him and say, who do you say this guy Jesus is? Is he the son of God? Is he, is he off, does, can he get you to heaven? And the blind man says, I don't, I don't know, I don't know anything about that. All I know is that I was blind my entire life and I met this man named Jesus and now I can see. That's what I know. Amen. So if you're, if you're dying, maybe go see that guy. Maybe, maybe you'll find out too. What I figured out in these stories and what's so fascinating to me about the stories of Jesus is that the changing the world for them and what Jesus modeled to us, changing the world was changing the world of the life right in front of them. Amen. Which I think in our world, in Christianity especially, we've, we've learned this idea that our job is to change the world, the globe in some way. And yes, we are supposed to go spread the gospel. But I think we forget that part of the gospel is bringing healing to people that are suffering in a physical way. More than just, here's a Bible, Jesus loves you, let me pray with you. Those are good things and those are important and that's what Jesus did for people. But he, the reason people came to Jesus and gave him the opportunity to do that is because he healed their world that was suffering. Look at the rest of the story in Mark chapter 2. This is, My favorite story out of the Bible, one of my favorites, is what it says. We get past that news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. Now, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Anybody ever seen Star Wars? Remember Star Wars? Yes. I'm not going to blast you that way. I started to say the best thing about Christmas season this year is December 18th when Star Wars comes out. But that's not true. That's the second best thing. Right behind Jesus' birth. I get it. Uh, 
But I, so Return of the Jedi, there's a scene in the middle of Return of the Jedi where, where the Ewoks are there and they're, and they're listening to C-3PO tell the story of what has happened so far up to, up to, uh, up to then in Star Wars. And I was, I was watching it recently and there's this scene where here's all these Ewoks like packed into this little, this little hut and there's you know, one little Ewok in the back like jumping up, like trying to, trying to see over everyone, which I thought, oh, that was me when I was a kid because I'm shorter than everyone else. Like, I was trying to see up over everybody because I wanted to see what was going on. And as soon as I saw that, I went, oh, man, that's the story. Like, here's all these people packed into this house listening to Jesus. And, you know, people can't even get in. Like, it's so packed, people can't even get to the windows outside to see in to them. There's so many people there. But you know who did make it on time were the religious people, which we'll see in a minute, because they were inside. They were, you know, they probably like front row, which they kicked people out of, because I know that's my seat. This is my, this is my, my weekly seat. What are you doing there? So, um, so visitor, there's no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. Stop right there for a second. Isn't that a fascinating statement? They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. Which sometimes I think, we kind of get in our own way sometimes. Like we're trying to bring people to Jesus, but we put too much of a crowd in the way to get him him there. We put all these obstacles. I just thought it was a fascinating statement. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. And we're going to talk about that in a minute because I want to picture that. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves. They didn't even say it. They just thought to themselves. What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. Which Could you imagine being Jesus' friend, like physically, the disciples walking around with him? That would be terrible. He couldn't think about anything because he already knew what you were thinking about, right? You know, you got mad at Jesus for telling you something, and he already knew you were thinking inside, man, this guy, Jesus, if I could just... He was like, yeah, I know, you want to hit me. Like, you know, that guy, like, before you could even... Could you imagine me married to that? But you couldn't even argue before you could get anything out. Like, they already know. Like, you just give up. You already know what I'm thinking. There you go. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them. He just called them out on it. Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? Now listen to this next statement. This is so fascinating to me. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. And there's so much going on in this story that's amazing to me. That first statement in verse 10, where he says, I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sin, is fascinating. Because here's one of the only stories where Jesus encounters someone that is broken and physically needing physical healing. And he doesn't, he doesn't go right for the physical healing. He says to him, your sins are forgiven. But he heals him of his physical healing because the, because the Pharisees are criticizing in their minds. And he says, okay, so I'll prove to you then that I have the authority to forgive sins. I'm going to physically heal him. What's fascinating to me about that is that in that world, in that moment, I'm going to touch this person and I'm going to heal something that is physically broken in their lives. That's my proof that I can bring hope to the world. Now flip that around for us. Shouldn't that also be our proof to the world? The love that we have for another. Doesn't the Bible say your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples? I think we forget sometimes that changing the world is not always about verbally preaching the gospel to someone, but it's physically bringing some love to their life and being the gospel 
that part of the gospel to them in the life that they have right now, in the suffering and the trouble that they're experiencing right now in their life. Because that is our proof to the world that we have authority to speak to them about hope and salvation. I think a lot of the world struggles with what Christianity has to say because we've forgotten to prove ourselves to the world. We're too busy giving them the message that they need to hear and forgetting that we also need to show them that message. There's more in this story that's fascinating to me. Think about this story for a second. Here's four guys that somehow befriended a paralyzed man, a man that had had this paralysis. And so think about in the ancient world what that meant. In the first century, uh, up to this point, philosophy, um, writings, all the, all the teachings of the world in that day put a high uh, negativity and a disvalue to people that were physically infirmed in some way. Socrates, Plato, they would write about uh, laws that existed that basically stated that if you were, if you were uh, physically broken, if you had been born paralyzed or with some physical infirmity, that, that you were devalued, you were not valuable to humanity, to society. The movie 300, if you've ever seen that, that story of the ancient Greek 300, uh, the story at the beginning of that where they talk about physically the Spartans would literally look, uh, examine children if they were, if they were not physically f- uh, what they considered to be fit, that they were going to grow up to be strong men, they would cast that away. That wasn't something made up for a movie. That's legitimate history. Humanity up to that point disregarded anyone that was physically infirmed. A man that was paralyzed was a beggar on the side of the street. In his world, his world was a six foot mat that he laid on every day. He had to depend on other people to clean him, to feed him. And in the ancient world, it was brutal. Think about how we would approach someone now or how we do approach someone now that's on the street, that's physically infirmed in some way, that's begging. We tend to overlook them, we walk past them. But in the ancient world, it's even worse. They saw it as some sin, just as the disciples asked about the man that was born blind, what sin did he commit in a past life? Or what did his parents do wrong to offend God that he would cause him to be born blind? Lepers had to live outside the city gates in their own colony. You didn't, even, you didn't even speak to them for fear that you could catch their leprosy. That's what the ancient world was like, and that's what this man experienced. But somehow, somehow there were four men that befriended this guy in a society that said, you don't befriend people that are broken like that. And the Bible doesn't tell us how or why. All the Bible tells us is these four men said, if we can get Jesus is back in town, if we can get this paralyzed man to Jesus, maybe he'll heal him. And they didn't quit. They got to the house. It's packed. Imagine this conversation between these four guys. I actually could see it happening. Like, you know, if you ever watch a group of guys working on something, the conversation is fascinating, right? Especially women. I don't think you're in it like... You know, you don't think the same, the same wavelength that we do. We, we go the long way around sometimes to get to, to a result. Like, these guys, I feel like, went the long way around. Here's four guys that probably could have just physically knocked people out of the way. But they said, you know what? No, no, no let's go on the roof. Let's cut, a, let's cut a hole in the roof. Like, I just wish I, was, I, wish I could have been there for that conversation, how this played out. Because, you know, in every group, there's one guy that has the crazy idea, Right? There's always one guy that's the, you know what? You should ride that lawnmower with that motorcycle engine in it. You should try to jump that, ca- you know, like there's always one guy. And then there's one guy that's like, you know, he's the, he's the more practical, like, well, you know, we got to get tools. We got to get this. We need, I don't, we don't have all that stuff with us, you know? And then imagine me and the paralyzed man who's laying there listening to this conversation. Like, like, wait, what are you, what, hold on. You're going to do what? 
And you really can't do anything but talk, you know, you can't move, so you're just laying there like, hey, hey guys, down here, could you, hold on, can I get a word in here? Like, and, you know, and at that point you're thinking, you know, and I guarantee you, here's what they're thinking. I guarantee you there's somebody in the group that's thinking, one, that's going, what if we drop him lowering down in the roof? And I guarantee you there's another guy that goes, we're already paralyzed. <laughs> And we're putting him down in front of Jesus. I mean, hopefully he's going to heal him, right? I mean, what's the worst that could happen? You ever, hear, you ever hear a guy, a group of guys, and one of them says, what's the worst that could happen? Get out your phone and start videotaping because it's going to be a good video, whatever's going to happen next. Like, I just, this conversation, I just wish I could be there for that. So this is what they did. And in that world, you know, there weren't houses like they are now. There was this flat roof and the roof was was used for like when they would wash clothes it's where they would hang things they would a lot of times would bathe on their roofs and have uh curtains around um and it was you know it was a physical place that they would use but it was clay and and mud and straw but imagine being the guy that owned this home and you're sitting in this house and you're entertaining you know when you entertain people and you have a party and you bring people over you know how you get your house looks nothing like it does normally right it's never that clean as when people come over. And really all the cleaning is, it's just all in the closet. Or it's in one room that the door's closed, like just pushed all in there, you know, we, and this whole thing. And you're, you're like, you're on point, right? You're on, you're on your game, like everything's gotta be right. Something starts going wrong, like, you know, we get out of sorts if we're the host. So imagine being the host in this house. And here's all this, this dirt and mud and stuff starts falling in your living room. Imagine how much that guy's freaking out. And then I think after the fact, these guys leave, and the you know, paralyzed man leaves, and he, yeah, great, I'm glad that guy healed him. Who's paying for the roof in my, the hole in my roof? You four guys come back, you know, you know those guys run off. They were like, they were gone. As soon as that guy got up, started walking out, all right, let's get out of here. We're gonna have to pay for this hole in the roof. <laughs> like imagining that guy, but then also imagining Jesus. Because here's what I feel like, if we were Jesus, here's what we would do. We would get annoyed by the distraction, right? Because we got something to say. We're preaching here. The Bible says while, while he's in the middle of him preaching God's word, four men dig a hole in the roof and lower this guy right in front of Jesus. Now, what Jesus could have done, I feel like, especially as pastors, a lot of times what we will do is like, All right, let's appreciate it. Time out. I got to finish preaching first before we can do that. But you know what Jesus did? He had a whole crowd in front of him. Here's a house that was packed. The whole city came to see him. But Jesus stopped. The crowd, the big crowd wasn't the concern. The big the concern was the one life in front of him that needed to be healed. He stopped everything. And if changing the whole world was about the big crowd that's there, he'd have kept on going and said, I'll get to you in a minute. But what Jesus modeled for us is that changing the world is the one life in front of you that needs help in that moment. That's what's so fascinating to me. So I have this idea that we mentally should stop trying to change the world. And we should focus in on the six foot mat of the paralyzed person in front of us that needs love. You ever seen the movie Evan Almighty? I'm going to show you this clip real quick. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful picture of, I, I feel like, how God talks to us or communes with us and what he has to say uh, to Evan in this clip. It's such a, such a, a, a great statement. People always want to change the world, don't know where to begin. And, the, you know, the way they put it, one random act of kindness at a time, the way I would also say it is, the one life right in front of you that you encounter every day at work, at school. Maybe it's about hearing their story. Maybe it's something as simple as like that laundry mat yesterday when those ladies heard the story of this girl and she needed to get to work. And, oh, you don't have to walk the two miles back home. Throw your stuff in my car and I'll drive you there. The hard part is Helping change the world of the life right in front of you means, one, 
you got to stop being selfish. Because just like Terrence, right? He was talking about in the offering. That's us. We're selfish. Everything is about us. I got to get to work. I got to get this done. My calendar's got this on it. I got to take care of this. The problem is, just as he said in that video, he starts laughing. Oh, your plans. Yeah, I know. You got plans. You got plans all over your calendar. But it's not about your plans. It means sometimes we have to sacrifice what's on that calendar to be aware and pay attention enough to the person in front of us that we don't even know that their life is falling apart. Their marriage is falling apart. They're struggling, trying to figure out whether they should commit suicide or not because they don't think they belong. They're going to lose their home. But we're too busy with our plans to change the world. We don't know where to begin. That's where we begin. But it means we have to be selfless, we have to be aware, and we have to refocus our life. It means refocusing not on the big globe like this and how do I, how do I lift up this whole world. See, this picture puts the burden on us. But there's a reason Jesus used the analogy of sheep in reference to us because sheep are not pack animals. Sheep are not meant to carry burdens. Mules do that. Horses carry burdens. He referred to us as sheep because you know what the sheep's job is? To just follow the voice of the shepherd and where he tells us to go. To graze in the field until he tells us to move to the next place. See, this view of the world, changing the world, puts the burden on our shoulders to carry that burden and that's not our burden. Our burden is to graze in the field with other people. And when the shepherd tells us to go over here, we go over there. And we love that person and we meet the need of that person. And when the shepherd tells us to go here, we do that. But I was going to eat some more of that grass. I know that was your plan, but my plan is that you come over here. That's how, but think about it. If we all did that, if Christianity, if those of us who profess to follow Christ, if we all did that, ultimately the world would change because one life at a time one six foot mat at a time where four men carry a paralyzed person to Jesus and Jesus stops and says the crowd doesn't matter right now you do and if we followed that model what would the world look like So my challenge to you today is to stop trying to lift the world up on your shoulders. Set that burden down. And be like the four men who just focused on the world of one man laying on a mat who was paralyzed. Every one of us, there's somebody in our life that we can look at that way. And today, I'd take a few moments the rest of your day and think about who's, who's a life in front of me that I can change the small life in front of me that's struggling that I haven't paid attention to, the thing that I can do that I haven't paid attention to because I've been too distracted, I've been too selfish. Who can I be a world changer to in one life today? Because I think that's what Jesus is calling us to. Let's pray.